One of the great mysteries of this world is why we don't have a film about the impossible, terrifying and inspiring expedition of the 10,000. I mean, what on earth isn't to watch when the story is about 10,000 mercenaries who marched from Greece into the heart of the Achaemenid Empire to war, and were forced to spend the next two years fighting their way back, harassed by assassins, satraps, blistering winters, starvation and intrigue, in an adventure to rival the Odyssey itself. The closest we've come is Walter Hill's adaptation of Sol Urich's novel The Warriors, a 1976 retelling of the story set in New York, and for those of you who haven't watched it, a great film. But that we don't have a visualisation of the original epic is frankly a tragedy. And what's more, thanks to the student of Socrates, the historian and philosopher Xenophon, we have a full-length account of it. More to the point, unlike many ancient accounts where centuries can separate the text from the event, Xenophon was actually an officer who was actually there for the entire thing, and thanks to military feats incredible enough for some to call him the greatest general before Alexander the Great, actually facilitated its ultimate success. So, without blathering on more about how great this story is, I'm just going to get right in and show you for yourselves. This story begins four generations after the famous Xerxes I, of Leonidas fame, fell from Persian power with Darius II's now King of Kings, Shayathia Shayathianum, probably butchered that, who ascended to power in the year 423 BCE. He had two sons, the elder and heir was Artaxerxes, and the other was Cyrus. They were both favoured by Darius, but when he died and Artaxerxes II became king, Cyrus may or may not have planned to assassinate him. Whatever the truth, the satrap Tissaphernes accused him of plotting against the throne. Cyrus was banished back to his satrapy, and in anger and fear that Artaxerxes might take more serious measures against him, he set about assembling an army to take the throne, this time with no doubt about it. Cyrus sent word to the world, and a lot of money besides, to gather this army. He appealed to Persian satraps and Greek generals alike, notably the Spartan exile Clearchos, a man worthy of his own video, perhaps I'll make one in the future. After a great deal of stress, bartering, charisma, and not a little deceit, Cyrus ended up with a great army. You see, he'd convinced many of them that they would be warring with Tissaphernes, the satrap, who, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, was the sort of troublemaker who'd gained a lot of enemies. Cyrus's army, therefore, was not aware that they would really be taking on Artaxerxes' entire Persian army instead. And so, the combined forces of Persian rebels and Greek mercenaries marched in their many, many thousands through Syria, Arabia, and Babylonia, the situation getting ever more dire as the Greeks in particular began to realise that the more money they were promised, the less sure of victory Cyrus was. But as we all know, cash is king, and the men persevered on. They reached the region of Cunaxa, 70 kilometers north of Babylon, in the year 401 BCE. Xenophon records that Cyrus's army numbered nearly 13,000 Greeks and 100,000 Persians, and that Artaxerxes, who had also arrived at Cunaxa, numbered over 1.2 million forces. Modern estimates put the numbers closer to 15,000 under Cyrus versus 40,000 under Artaxerxes. Still, not good odds for Cyrus. The Battle of Cunexa was a bloody one indeed, but it should be said not for the Greeks, who allegedly barely lost a man. Nor even for many of the Persians on Cyrus' side, who, together with the elite Greek units, utterly routed Artaxerxes' forces. However, the battle ended up as a draw. This was because Cyrus the Younger, as we name him to differentiate him from the more famous King Cyrus the Great, 
was himself slain after Alton Acontisetis Palto who put on Optalmon Biaios. Someone hurled a javelin which struck him forcibly beneath his eye. So with Artaxerxes routed for now and Cyrus dead, Cyrus is second in command Ariaios promised to lead the 10,000 Greeks under Clearchos safely back to Greece. They began their journey, but the devious Tissaphernes convinced Artaxerxes to let him lead Ariaios astray. He approached the Persian and Greek forces and invited them to discuss a truce. In secret, he then convinced that Ariaios did effect to Artaxerxes, no doubt with promises of a pardon and riches. So the dead Cyrus' generals came to Tissaphernes' tent to discuss terms. But as Diodorus Siculus recounts, Ectes Tissaphernus genes artises poenikios homentus terethegus endon sinelabe. When a red flag was raised from Tissaphernes' tent, he apprehended the generals inside. They were sent to Artaxerxes, who had most of them executed, including Clearchos. The Greeks were now leaderless after this coup de grace and stranded in the middle of Asia without allies. Xenophon's passage at this point pulls no punches in describing just how dire their situation was. Now I know some of you aren't fans of the long Greek or Latin passages, but hey, I like to practice. So here it is, broken up a little in its full attempted 5th century BCE pronunciation. En pole de aporia es an hoi helenes, en noumenoi hoti epitais baseleos turais es an cyclo de autois pante polla kai etne kai poleis polemiai es an agorande udeiseti parexein emmelen. The Greeks were incredibly worried, realizing that they were at the gates of the king, Artaxerxes, surrounded on all sides by many enemy tribes and cities with no one to provide them supplies. Apecon de Tesela dos umeion in Muria stadia, hegemon de Udeis tes o du en. Potamoi de Diercon at the Apatoi en Mesotes oica de Hodu, that they were 1,000 miles from Greece without a guide to show them the way, barred by impassable rivers cutting across their return. Prude docis and the Autus cae, hoi sunciro and abantes barbaroi. Monnoi de catechelemennoi ersan, u de hippeia udenne sumachon echontes, that their barbarian allies who had accompanied them with Cyrus had betrayed them, and that they were alone, with not even a single horse to aid them. Hoste udelon en hotinicontes men udenna an catechanoien, hete tentonte, auton udeis an lepteie. So, it was clear that to survive they could not kill anyone, while if they were defeated, not one would be left alive. A true dilemma. To march a thousand miles without starting a war, or stay and be killed to the last. But as the Greeks panicked, Xenophon gathered the remaining captains together. He had been a mid-ranking officer until now, but after laying on the Socratic logic thick, the others elected him their leader, and set out under his command on this epic journey back to Greece. No sooner had the force begun its retreat and crossed the river Zapatas when they faced their first challenge. The Persian satrap and double agent Mithridates, who had faked being their friend while secretly obeying Tissaphernes. He led a force against the Greek rearguard who saw no reason to fear him until Mithridates started firing. The first day they lost many casualties, but Xenophon helped them adapt quickly. As they continued marching across ravines and through old cities, the Greeks found ways to deal with the foe that pursued them. The Rhodian slingers were known for their ability to hurl stones at a great distance, so they were strategically placed alongside Cretan archers who learned to fire with the enemy's own arrows right back at them. The Greeks skirmished with their Persian foes so successfully that Tissaphernes himself resolved to lead the forces against them. The Greeks and their pursuers journeyed on, fighting constantly, the former taking supplies from the villages that they passed through. But such games of cat and mouse were unsustainable, and the two forces were eventually made to face each other head-on when Tissaphernes overtook them from the right flank and blocked the Greeks' only route home, a narrow mountain pass. Perhaps they really did learn a lesson from Leonidas in the 300. Xenophon, who had been commanding from the rear himself, spoke with the vanguard commander at the front, Cheirisophus, and came up with a plan to dislodge the Persians. 
You see, there was a path to the mountain summit, which, if occupied, would mean Tisafernes would no longer be able to safely hold the pass, and would be forced to retreat and let the Greeks through. So Xenophon resolved to lead a force of light cavalry and infantry in an all-out sprint for the summit. The Persians noticed their dash, and suddenly it became a race to the top. Both Persians and Greeks were shouting encouragement to their men, and Xenophon, riding up and down his own lines as they pushed forward at speed, shouted out, Andres nun epiten helada nomits de te hamilastai. Nun prostus paidas kaitas kunaikas. Nun oligon pones antes amake ten loipen pore somata. Men, believe now that we strive for Greece, strive for our wives and daughters, pushing ourselves a little now for this very moment, that we can continue without struggle for the rest of our journey. If only I had the voice of Theoden King, but this is sounding a lot like the ride of the Rohirrim to me. And when one man, the Sicyonian named Soteridas, complained to Xenophon that it was fine for him to speak like that when on horseback while the men toiled with their armour and shield on foot, Xenophon, without a word, leapt off his horse, seized Soteridas' shield, and pushed him onto the horse, continuing to lead the infantry on foot, burdened as they were with armour. So inspired were the men that they re-energised and even shouted at Soteridas to give Xenophon his horse back so he could continue exhorting them up the hill. A little footnote there to Xenophon's natural charisma and leadership. The Greeks, fueled by the passion of Xenophon's speech, beat the Persians to the summit, and with the high ground to their benefit, the Persians turned tail and retreated under their blows. So Cairisophus led the bulk of the Greek army through the mountain pass, as Xenophon led his advance force down it until they met and spread out on the plentiful plains of the Tigris River. There were many villages here which the Greeks soon took supplies from, including herds of cattle. They got a bit lazy in their plundering though when Tissaphernes and Ariaios finished their longer route around the mountains and managed to cut some Greek stragglers down. The Persian forces were so incensed at the theft of their lands that they went so far as to start burning down the villages themselves to stop the Greeks taking more. Cairisophus and Xenophon debated what to do next. The Persians had started a habit of making camp a few miles away from the bulk of their force, wary of a prolonged confrontation. Xenophon commented on the enemy's actions, highlighting the irony of them setting fire to their own lands, and confirming that by now they had, if not militarily, but psychologically consigned themselves to the fact that this wandering republic of Greeks had claimed the land where they marched as their own. A small boost in morale, before they decided not to take the moral high ground on some village burning at least. Confirming that crossing the deep Tigris would be too risky, they marched for the land of Armenia, igniting villages in a misleading direction to throw the Persians off their scent, joining them in this endeavour, if no others. To reach Armenia, they needed to force their way through the perilous mountains inhabited by the Karduki tribes, an autonomous people who had broken from Persian rule and maybe the ancestors of the modern Kurdish people. The Greeks failed to form an alliance with them, however, and had to deal with the Karduki's guerrilla-style attacks through many nights in this rough mountain terrain. Their tactics went so far as to roll giant boulders down hills to smash into soldiers and baggage. The only way to survive their onslaught was constantly rotating the vanguard and rearguard, whereby Xenophon would lead soldiers in steep climbs to higher ground, circle the enemy, dislodge them, and have Cadisophus crush them with the heavy infantry. A week they spent like this, before finally emerging into Armenia free of the Karduki. As Xenophon put it, at their hands they had suffered more troubles than they had under Artaxerxes and Tissaphernes put together. Epaton kakahossa u de tasympanta hypo basileos kaitisapermus. Now they continued their valiant retreat further, back on track towards Greece, now trekking through winter snow up to six feet deep. They may have lost the Persians, who could no longer pursue them, but they had new enemies to face, frostbite and hypothermia. After many had succumbed to the ice, they befriended an Armenian village elder with gifts and well wishes, who provided them with a guide to help them continue. So coming to the lands of the Teochi, which borders modern Georgia, Armenia and Turkey in ancient Anatolia, the 10,000 supplies were running low. When they came upon a fortress then, the leaders resolved to conquer it for its provisions. 
A fierce battle ensued whereby the defenders rained down fire upon the Greeks' heads, but by sprinting between points of cover, they reached the walls, dodging the barrage of fire and stones, taking the fortress and the food within. Again moving forward, they arrived at the city of Erzurum, whose governor again provided them with a guide. The reason behind this unlikely support was because they were at war with the neighbouring lands, and the guide had been ordered to encourage the Greek marching republic to lay waste to it as he led them through. Whatever the motive though, the guide indeed led them through this land to where the most iconic chapter of this saga took place. They reached the mountain called Perkes, at which point Xenophon, who was still commanding the rear, heard a great cry rise from the front lines. Galloping up the flank, he rushed to see what had caused the commotion, whereupon a beautiful vista opened out in front of him, and he saw what the men were echoing in joyful shouts. Talata, talata! They had reached the Euxene, or Black Sea, and with it came the hope and relief that the allied Sinopean city of Trapezus was under a week's march away. The joy spread through the Greek ranks like wildfire who fell to embracing each other in tears. They weren't quite out of the woods yet though, and were soon forced to fight through the rugged land of the Macrones. It was tough at first, until an Athenian slave said he actually came from this land and would parley with its people. They managed to form a truce, and with pledges and gifts exchanged, the Macrones built them a bridge across the river that they needed to cross. Again dealing with yet more hostile natives, they drew up battle lines which would allow them to simultaneously fight and keep moving forward until finally they broke free of the enemy and reached Trapezus. They stayed here a full month, enjoying the comforts of home, athletic spectacles, theatre and good food. But it still wasn't over, and the remainder of the 10,000 still needed to sail back to Hellas. Trapezus couldn't supply them with all the ships they needed, so they sent Cairisophus back in one to collect more. Meanwhile, Xenophon convinced the men to follow his plan for how they would survive until Cairisophus returned. Through disciplined organisation, foraging and pillaging parties would be tracked on their departure and return, so their whereabouts would always be known. They also convinced neighbouring cities to construct roads through the more impassable terrain, so that they could move about for provisions more easily. They convinced them through a little intimidation, capitalising on the locals' fear of their mighty force, and promising that if the roads were built, they would be gone even sooner. The Sinopean Trapezuntines then took Xenophon's force into the hostile land of the Drilai, who caused much suffering for the Greek outpost. With half his army, Xenophon was able to conquer this land and take its spoils. Unfortunately, on coming back to Trapezus, Cairisophus had still not returned with the fleet, so Xenophon sent the sick and elderly back to Hellas on what ships they could, and resolved to march by land to the Greek city of Kerasus. The next few weeks saw much of the same, the Greeks forming tactical alliances or fighting with the inhabitants of the lands they marched through, before finally reaching Hellas proper. Surprisingly, there was more internal dissent on the last few legs of their journey than there were in deep Persia, but they did eventually pull through. Xenophon himself ended up a mercenary for hire, along with many of the other Greeks, and after some time at war, finally settled in Leuctra as a Spartan colonist, then as an independent man, as you can learn about in my video on his life. And with that, we come to the end of this epic tale. Its legacy has been profound, inspiring many later stories, and even setting a new standard for military tactics, which would be imitated by some of history's greatest generals. And who knows, maybe in the future, we'll get to see this depicted at last on the big screen.